everyone, my name is Miriam Kuzberry. I'm going to be talking about pure braids and link concordance. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. Um, and of course, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. This is a really great seminar. Um, I'm going to give a disclaimer that I am not a professional at recording talks. I know this is asynchronous. So uh, thank you in advance for your patience with my um, technology skills. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you first a little bit of background about the project and why you might find the the result that I'm going to tell you about interesting. Then I'm going to tell you about the string link concordance group, which is the correct context, in my opinion, for talking about pure braids and link concordance. And then finally, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Milner's invariants, which are the main tools that I used in this work. So first, I should say that everything in this talk is going to be smooth and oriented. So I'm not going to say it a billion times. I'm not going to talk about anything that's, you know, just PL. I'm not going to talk about anything non-orientable. Okay, so everything is smooth and oriented in this talk. So where we are going to start, maybe big picture, is that I really like, um, I really like groups. And so this is sort of the philosophy. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about knots and groups. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll see where pure braids and link concordance comes in. So I want to remind you that there is a binary operation on knots. So there is a binary operation on knots in S3. Maybe I'll remind you that things are oriented one more time. So on oriented knots, in S3 defined like this. So the connected, we call it connected sum, and the connected sum of two knots, K and J, is the connected sum of S3 with K in it with S3 with J in it. So for example, you could think about this diagrammatically. So here is, I wanna make sure I actually draw the knot I want to. So here's the figure eight knot. I'm gonna orient it this way. And here's the trefoil one of them, and I'll orient it this way. And if we wanna take their connected sum, then all you do is you cut them open and you attach them by an oriented band in basically the simplest way that makes sense. So maybe I'll use the fact that I'm on an iPad, I'll just copy this over. Great. So as I said, all you do, oops, sorry about that. All you do is you cut them open and you attach an oriented band, basically as simple of a band as possible connecting them, and then this is the connected sum of these two knots. So it turns out that um, the set, of knots in S3 with connected sum as the operation is a monoid, not a group. So this is actually a really nice exercise for any graduate students out there watching this, or just if you want to think about this. Um, it's a nice exercise to prove that inverses don't exist because genus is additive. And in case you don't know what genus is, the genus of a knot is the minimum genus of a surface um, such that, so sigma is an oriented surface. Oop, there I go, reminding you of, uh, it's oriented again. Oriented surface such that the boundary is the knot. So nice exercise. Use that to prove that inverses don't exist. Okay, so knots in S3 with the binary operation of connected sum, they form a monoid, they don't form a group. So if we want a group, where would we get inverses from? So we need to define an equivalence relation in order to be able to do this. So we say that not K and J in S3 are concordant if there is a properly embedded annulus Uh, 
uh, maybe I'll call this C inside S3 cross I, such that the boundary of C is equal to the disjoint union of K and J. So I drew you a little cartoon picture here. So this box, you should think of this box as a schematic picture of S3 cross I, where at the top we have S3 cross zero, and at the bottom we have S3 cross one. So a concordance between K and J is something like this. So smooth, remember I said everything in this talk is smooth, properly embedded annulus inside S3 cross I. So you notice it could look extremely strange, but this is still an embedding of an annulus. And you could think that concordance is an equivalence relation that's stronger than homotopy, but weaker than ambient isotopy. So in that vein, uh, we say that a knot K in S3 is slice if there is a smooth, I guess I already said smooth, I'm sorry, a properly embedded disk delta inside the four ball now, uh, such that uh, the boundary of delta is k. So again, here's a schematic picture. Here's a little cartoon of the four ball with S3 as boundary. We have k living in S3. Note that the only knots that bound a disk in S3 are the, the only knot that bounds a disk in S3 is the unknot. So um, this is a, a pretty special thing. It's kind of a generalization of bounding a disk in S3. So you could ask about knots that bound a disk in B4. So something like this. And it turns out, so there's this beautiful theorem of Fox and Milner from 66, which is that the set of knots with the operation of connected sum, um, that monoid, if you mod out by concordance, that forms the knot concordance group. So the inverse of knot up to concordance, basically what you do is you turn it upside down. It's kind of the idea. Okay, so what do we know about this group? Here's a group, let's, let's learn some facts about it. So it has some great properties. So one thing is that um, it is abelian. So this is in the original paper and I point this out to you because as we'll see, the story for links is not gonna be the same. So this is a fact that I want you to remember. It also has elements of finite order, namely order two. In fact, this is um, probably one of my favorite open questions in the study of knot concordance is does the knot concordance group have finite order elements of orders other than two? So this is a very nice question. Jerry Levine showed in 69 that the knot concordance gr group surjects onto this big group. So Z infinity plus Z two to the infinity plus Z four to the infinity. Um, and we call this a, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, we call this A the algebraic concordance group. So already this should tell you that the knot concordance group is very, very large. And in fact, this algebraic concordance group is not the whole story because Kasson and Gordon showed in 75 that the kernel of this map is non-trivial. Furthermore, Jang showed in 81 that the kernel of this map actually contains a Z infinity subgroup. So the story for knot concordance is much, much bigger than just what's in the algebraic concordance group. And in regards to that, the open problem that I mentioned a minute ago about what elements of finite order the knot concordance group has in it, maybe I'll say that many of the pre-images of order four elements and the algebraic concordance group were actually infinite order in the knot concordance group. So this was shown by Livingston and Nyack in 99. So this is, um, you know, the, the knot concordance group, it's abelian, but it's very large, it's very mysterious, and there's still a lot that we don't know about it. Maybe I'll also say, that Cochran, Orr, and Tegner proved in 2003 that there's a geometric filtration of the knot concordance group whose successive quotients are non-trivial. And furthermore, Harvey showed in 08 that the successive quotients of this filtration actually has infinite rank. So this group is very, very large and somewhat mysterious. So I promised you in the title of the talk that I was gonna talk about links. So maybe what I wanna to get to now after sort of fleshing out some of the important properties of the structure of the knot concordance group is maybe let's start by understanding um, what happens if you talk about links in, these context, in this context. So what about links? Well, <clears throat> whew, 
there is a notion of link concordance. So there is a notion of link concordance. There's a couple actually. So maybe we should specify which one we're talking about. So we could talk about strong concordance. So this is this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk, actually. Um, so we say that two n component links <clears throat> L1 and L2 are concordant. Maybe I'll say are strongly. Concordant if uh, their components are concordant. So if their components are concordant by disjoint annuli. Maybe I'll say by N disjoint annuli. So this is what we mean by strong concordance. And so when I say link concordance for the rest of the talk, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I should also mention that there's a notion of weak concordance. So L1 and L2 are weakly concordant if uh, there exists... Um, I guess I've already said smooth, if there exists a properly embedded genus zero surface, or maybe I'll say genus zero cobordism between them. Okay, so it's clear from this that we can define a notion of concordance for links, and like I said, we're gonna stick with uh, strong concordance for the rest of the talk. But there's actually a bigger problem here if we wanna to try to define a concordance for group for links. And that problem is that connected sum, so connected sum uh, isn't well-defined. For links. Even if you orient them, and even if ordered. So I wanna mention this because I've had, I've had a few people ask, well, what happens if you, if you order them? Surely that fixes the problem, and I hope to convince you that it doesn't. So here's, here's an, an, an example as to why. So let's consider these two links. This is um, the 4-4 torus link, I guess, depending on how you count, I'm gonna call this a 4-4 torus link, and then uh, the hop link, or I guess the 2-2 torus link. Um, so think about how you might take the connected sum of these two. So I'm going to say connected sum and put it in quotation marks. So there's a few different things we could do and they are allowable, um, if we were using not. So, so here's one, uh, let me turn off erase entire stroke. So we could, um, hold on, let's see. So let's order them. I guess I already ordered the half link. So this is the first component, second component, and let's order this one. So one and two. So what we can do, we can attach a band here and we can attach a band here. So if you do that, you should be able to convince yourself that um, you can isotope the result of that to the negative half link actually. So this guy. Uh, let me make sure I got the orientations correct. Here we go. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't attach the second band here, getting ahead of myself. This is why giving a talk live is, is nice. Even online, I can, you know, feel the energy from the chat. So thanks for being patient with me. Uh, Right, so if we use those two bands, then we get something that is isotopic to the negative hop flank. But I wanna show you that if we took a different set of bands that would still be allowable, we're gonna get something different. So let's try, let's, um, so between these first components, let's take the same band, let's use this one. And now instead of that band that I already drew for the second component, let's instead do this thing. Let's attach it on the other side. So this is still, if you 
think about it. This is still allowable. This nothing particularly weird is going on with this band. And uh, now I hope to convince you that these are actually not going to be concordant to each other. So here's what I want to point out that if, so I'll call this, this link L if with, with these different bands. So if L and the negative hop link uh, were concordant, so if they were concordant, uh, and if connected sum was well-defined on concordance classes, so if it was well-defined on concordance classes, Then, well, I already had this written here because this is a, a little bit of a pain to draw. Then, if we were to connect some both of these with the um, with the positive hop flank, then those should be the same, right? If this was well defined on concordance classes, you know, then then this should all work out. Well, what you should notice is that the connected sum, in some sense, of the positive hop flank and the negative hop flank. Well, you could do it like this. So here's. The positive one and you could imagine you know cutting it open and then attaching uh, the negative hop link below it like this and now this is just the unlink this isn't just concordant to the trivial link this is the trivial link okay so what about what's going on on the right because that's that's already a pretty weird a pretty weird knot or a pretty weird link, sorry. But it turns out if you go through, um, if you go to not info, this link actually has signature one. Uh, it is isotopic to um, what some people call 929, or you could also call it L9A35 if you want to look it up in not info. So what that means is that on the right hand side, that's not even a weekly slice. So not even weekly slice. So my point is that, uh, oh, I didn't even write sum, I'm sorry. So my point is that connected sum is just not well-defined on links, even if oriented, even if ordered, even if you try to define it on concordance classes. So we gotta do something else. Okay. Maybe I'll also say there is another notion of connected sum of links um, that people generally use in the Hagard floor homology world. So people will often talk about the connected sum of two links as what happens if you um, choose a specific component to connect sum at and you only attach one band. So I'm going to call this, though I guess we won't return to it, but I feel like it's good to mention it that the connected sum in the Hagard floor world is choose a specific marked component and then attach a band there. So then um, the result of that is going to be this thing. So what you should notice from this is that the connected sum of an N component link, this, this Hagard floor sense, um, the connected sum of an n component link and an n component link is a 2n minus 1 component link. And so if you want a group of links, or if you want a group of n component links where you're fixing the number of components, uh, this won't do it for you. I will say though, there is a really cool group that you get from this, um, and this is work of Donald and Owens in 2012, if you, if you wanna go look into that. Because it's a, quite a nice paper, very cool group. So I wanted to set the stage and have you understand why the not concordance group is interesting and why me, we might wanna generalize it to links and what goes wrong. So now I wanna tell you about my favorite way of fixing this problem that connected sum is not well-defined for links and that is the string link concordance group. So basically what's gonna happen, uh, that was an unintentional pun as you'll <laughs> see in a second. Uh, so the idea, for a behind the string link concordance group is that you want to base a link with a disk. 
uh, and then connect some along the disc. So connect some along the disc. So here's, here's an example. So here's the hop link on the left. Um, the idea of basing a, a link with a disc is you take a disc that intersects each component of your link once positively. And then what you do is you cut open uh, S3 along that disc. So on the left, we have a N component link uh, L in S3. And then if you cut open along that disc, what you're going to get is you're going to get an uh, ordered, I guess maybe this should have been ordered, that's fine. Um, then what you're going to get is an ordered N component string link in D2 cross I. And maybe I should point out that if you want to go the other way, if you want to go from a string link to a link in S3, then all you have to do is close this up, just like you would close up a braid. So there's some big, big foreshadowing there. But maybe I should also point out that representatives are not unique. So if you look on the left, that's still a hop flank. All I've done is a couple of Rademeister 2 move or Rademeister 1 move, sorry, and you know twisted it up a little bit. So what we can do is we can cut open now along um, along this disc. And you can check for yourself that if you do that, then you are going to get this string link, um, which is absolutely not the same thing as this one. I mean, just from staring at it, it seems preposterous that they would be the same, but you can also prove it using some invariance. And so this is actually not going to throw that much of a wrench in our plans, as I'll tell you in a minute, but bear with me. Okay, so I told you that there was going to be some concordance involved, so I need to tell you like how, um, how you can talk about concordance of string links, and before I tell you the technical definition, I want to show you a picture. So if you had two links that were concordant. Maybe I'll use, hmm, I'll use this color. Okay. So let's assume that we have some concordance between actual links in S3. So it looks something like this. What we want is we want to be able to talk about concordance of string links as if we had like a concordance between the closed links and we sort of cut it open um, at each time slice. So we want this to sort of be compatible with this notion of, you know, um, basing a whole concordance by a disk cross I. Maybe you could think of it that way. And so the, the technical definition for a concordance between two string links is something that looks like this. So we say that they're concordant if there's a smooth embedding of, uh, sorry, this should have been n. If there is a smooth embedding of n i cross i, n copies of uh, different copies of i cross i into b three cross i, which is transverse to the boundary, such that these following things are true. So the way you should think about this technical condition is this is really what you need if you want to be able to sort of close up along a string link concordance to get an actual concordance between links in S3. And lest you think that this is just too contrived and this isn't actually gonna be that, have that much to do with links in S3, even though representatives are not unique in concordance, Habegger and Lin showed in 1998 that a N component string link in D2 cross I is concordant to the trivial string link if and only if its closure is strongly concordant to the N component unlink. Or in other words, equivalently, if and only if it is strongly sliced. So these string links really do give us a notion of when things are um, trivial in concordance in S3. Okay, so now it turns out that if you take these objects instead of just links with connected sum, these actually form a group. So this group was defined by Le Dime in 1988, and uh, we call it the string link concordance group. The objects are n component string links, modulo string link concordance, and the group operation is stacking. So just like um, if you were to um, multiply braids, so just you just stack them on top of each other, you know.
just like braids like this. Okay, so this is a little bit of foreshadowing because what you should notice is that um, pure braids are actually a subset of string links and they're not equal. So we saw an example, right? This is a string link that is not a pure braid. So pure braids sit inside the set of string links and string links are um, a subset of tangles. But notice that you know, you can't get every tangle this way. The string links really come about in a special way that you cut open a link across, along a disc. Um, so string links sit inside uh, tangles. Okay, maybe another thing that you should notice is that the string link concordance group on one strand is actually isomorphic to the not concordance group. So if you think about objects in the uh, string link concordance group on one strand, it's literally just knots that you've cut open at a point, and that's kind of how we were talking about connected sum. So a couple other things that we can figure out about this group is that they all inject into each other. So CI injects into CJ for I less than or equal to J, exactly the way braids do. So you could think that if you have a string link an I component string link sigma, then what you can do is you can just add um, J minus I trivial strands and get something um, and, and you know get a subgroup. And this is an injective map. So the first thing that I really want to point out about the pure braid group is that, or about the, the string link concordance group, is that the pure braid group do, it doesn't just sit inside it as a subset. Um, it The pure braid group actually injects into the group. It's not just that every pure braid is a string link. Um, and in fact, Le Dimay used this to show that the string link concordance group is non-abelian whenever n is greater than or equal to 3. It's a little more difficult to show that n was equal to 2. You have to use theta graphs, or one way to do it is theta graphs, and de Campos showed that in 1995. Um, so this is quite different from the not concordance group, I should say. Remember, the not concordance group is abelian, so already the story is very different. And this is also why the string link concordance group is my favorite notion of link concordance group, because all of the other link concordance groups floating around out there, um, there are the, the couple, I guess, those are all abelian. And to me, there's something very non-abelian about links. So string link concordance group is not abelian. Um, it's still very large, so if you remember that theorem of Cochrane, Orr, and Teichner from O3 about the n-solvable filtration, there's this geometric filtration whose successive quotients are non-trivial. This also works for string links. And Harvey showed in 08 that the abelianization of successive quotients of this for string links also has infinite rank. So this group is huge, and in fact its abelianization is huge. And maybe I'll also say there's some finite order elements in there. So Jay Chun Cha showed in 08 that there are infinitely many order two elements in uh, these quotients, or infinitely many order two elements in, in uh, the mth term of the unsolvable filtration that are not in the m plus second uh, term. So um, there's a lot going on in the string link concordance group. So maybe a natural question here knowing all this and knowing that this sort of big difference between the string link concordance group and the not concordance group is that string links are non-abelian, one might ask how much of the non-abelian structure of the string link concordance group is just inherited from the pure braid group. So this is sort of a natural question to ask. And this actually becomes somewhat difficult because as Kirk Livingston and Wang showed in 1998, uh, the pure braid group, PN, is not a normal subgroup of the string link concordance group for n greater than two. So this makes things somewhat difficult because we're, we really need to quotient. We can't just quotient by the pure braid group. So what I showed last year is that the quotient of the string link concordance group mod the normal closure of the pure braid group is still non-abelian for all n. So you could think that morally what's happening here 
So morally, this is a complementary result uh, to the Habegger and Lin classification of links up to link homotopy in uh, 1990. So classification of links up to link homotopy, which is in 1990. And here's what I mean by this. So Habegger and Lin in 1990 showed that um, the string link concordance group mod link homotopy. So recall link homotopy um, is when two links are homotopic by homotopies that miss the other components. Um, this set surjects, or I guess this group surjects onto the pure braid group mod link homotopy. So in some sense, you could, you could think about this as Habegger and Lin's result is saying that string link concordance up to link homotopy reduces completely to pure braids. And what I showed is that, in fact, if you don't mod out by link homotopy, if you look at concordance, um, there's a lot more going on in the string link concordance group than just what's happening from the pure braid group. So in my remaining time, I would like to tell you a little bit about how I proved this. So um, the main tools in my proof, so the main tools in the proof are Milner's invariants. So for those of you who are a little familiar with Milner's invariants, um, that they are somewhat difficult to define. So really what I want to do is I want to give you a flavor of the original definition. And then by the end, I'm going to give you an algorithm for computing it that's a little easier than, than the original notion of them. So where I want to start in talking about these things is I want to remind you that if you have a N component link and um, Li is the zero framed longitude of the ith component of that link, then if you think about the homology class of that longitude, um, you can write that in terms of generator. So remember the, the um, H1 of the complement of a link is generated by meridians. So if you were to take that ith zero framed longitude, write it out, um, write it out in terms of meridians as an element of H1, then the coefficients of those meridians are going to exactly be the linking number between Li and the longitude corresponding to that meridional generator. So uh, where these Xi's, those are these, these meridional generators of H1. So you can unpack all these definitions and, and this falls out. So that in mind, with that in mind, let's let G be the fundamental group of the link complement. So pi one of S3 minus a neighborhood of the link. So recall, you know, it's basic fact from, from algebraic topology that um, the first homology is the abelianization of the fundamental group. So H1 of the link complement is isomorphic to the abelianization of G, which I'm gonna write like this, G mod its commutator subgroup. So the reason I'm mentioning this is what if, so what if we looked at the image of that ith longitude in a different quotient of G? So this is really the idea behind Milner's invariance. And we're going to look at the image of longitudes in very specific quotients of the fundamental group for reasons that we'll have to do with concordance that I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So recall that the lower central series of G is defined recursively like this. So G sub one, the first term of the lower central series, that's just G. And G sub n plus one is the commutator of G 
with GN. And if you use a different convention for commutators or for the lower central series, I apologize. This is, this is just the one that I'm using in my talk. So the reason I'm bringing this up is it turns out, thanks to Casson in 75, that if L1 and L2 are concordant links with fundamental groups G uh, and H, so those are fundamental groups with their complements, then it turns out that G mod G sub Q and H mod H sub Q are isomorphic for all Q. So the quotients of the fundamental group for a link uh, mod its lower central series, those whole groups are uh, concordance invariants, basically. Okay. And as a corollary of this, Casson also showed that if you have concordant links in S3 whose zero-framed longitudes are Y1 through Yn and Z1 through Zn, then it turns out that Yi is in G sub Q, so the Qth term of the lower central series of G, if and only if Zi is in H sub Q. So really, these are some deep facts that tell us that these, looking at these longitudes in the quotient of the fundamental group by these lower central series terms is something really, really powerful. So I'm not going to tell you the exact original definition of Miller's invariance. As I said, somewhat complicated, but I want to give you a flavor for what they do, and then I'm going to show you an easier way to compute them. So Milner first defined them in 1954. They are a set of integer-valued link concordance invariants. There are also string link concordance invariants, but we won't super get into the distinction there. So we'll denote them mu bar li, so l for the link, i, something I'll tell you about in a second. These are integer-valued. So here's where that i comes in. i is some multi-index. So i is a list of numbers i1 through ik, and each of those i sub j's is in is a number from 1 to n. So remember, n is the number of components of the link. What they do is they detect how deep the ith longitude of l is in gq. So what you could think is, you know, if... Uh, you know, if, if the longitude of L was already, um, let's think about this. If, if the longitude of L was already a commutator of the other components, then all of these linking numbers would be zero, right? Maybe here, here's the idea that if you, if this LI was already in this commutator, then all of this would be zero. So then maybe what you would think is, okay, let's look at the image of L in the next quotient of the um, fundamental group by the next term of the lower central series. That's sort of what's going on. But geometrically what's happening is that Miller's invariants are higher order linking numbers. So for example, the Milner invariance um, with just two indices, so mu bar L, I, J, those literally are just the linking number, the usual linking number between the ith component and the jth component. So L, J, okay? So here's where start, things start getting a little more complicated. If we have three indices, so, uh, ijk, this is the triple linking number. So triple linking number. So for example, what it can do, um, you could apply it to the Borromean rings. Let's see if I can draw the Borromean rings on the fly here. Uh, we'll go like this and like this, and there we go. So there's the Borromean rings. Um, so the triple linking number is what shows that the Borromean rings aren't sliced. So Borromean rings has, um, mu bar one, two, three equal to one. So notice for the Bromine rings, all of the pairwise linking numbers are actually zero, but it's still not trivial. And the, the um, Milner invariant of weight three is what, do, what does it. Okay, so these things are very powerful, but an unfortunate fact is that generally they're only defined up to the greatest common divisor of a subset of them of a lower order. But a fortunate fact, is that if we're computing Milner invariants for string links instead of links, then they're actually well-defined without quotienting by anything. If you're curious about this, you can look at, um, there's work of Jerry Levine and Haberger and Lin that talk about this. 
So they're very powerful. Sometimes we can compute them. Let's see some of their properties. So as you can imagine, though I guess I, I already said this, um, work of Casson in 75 that I mentioned before shows that Milner's invariants are actually linked concordance invariants. And the original definition was very um, was using combinatorial group theory, but Turayev and Porter independently showed in uh, 79 and 80, respectively, that you can compute them by evaluating Massey products on the boundary tori and the complement of L. If you're familiar with Massey products, you can you can do that. Cochrane showed the dual picture in 90, so this is actually the one that I'm going to use and tell you a little bit about, that you can actually compute the first non-vanishing Milner invariant using inter iterated intersections of surfaces. So they sort of function as a dual to a Massey system that would define Massey products. And uh, more recently, Conant, Conant, Schneiderman, and Teichner showed in 15 that you can also find the first non-vanishing Milner invariant using intersection trees of twisted Whitney towers. And maybe the most modern thing that has happened with these things is that Gorski, Liu, and Moore showed in last year that for two component links with linking number zero, you can actually compute mu bar 1122 from link floor homology. So this is the Sotolovine invariant. And uh, that same group of people together with Ty Lidman also showed last year that for three component links, you can compute uh, mu bar 123 from link floor homology. So there's a few different ways of computing these things, and they have some implications for like very modern high tech tools. So the main way that I compute them is using surfaces, and I want to give you an idea of how that works. And I'm going to show you by example. So we can detect non-zero Milner invariants by intersecting surfaces and computing linking numbers of the intersection curves. So sort of morally what we're going to do is we're going to index curves by meridians and iterated commutators of meridians. And maybe morally, the reason why this happens is because if you have a link group, it turns out that even though um, even though the link group is generally very complicated, has a lot of generators, um, the nilpotent quotients are actually just generated by one generator for each component of the link. So this is why we can do that. And I'm going to leave the relations a mystery. If you really want to talk about this, we can we can talk about it. And I, sh I can show you where to look. So point is, we're going to index curves by meridians. So let's see this in practice. So what, what we're going to do <coughs> is build something called a surface system. So here's a link. This is the whitehead link. Um, you can compute for yourself that this has linking number zero. And so linking number is actually not enough to tell us much about the, the whitehead link. So we're gonna try to do something higher order. So here's how you build a surface system. First, we're going to build some curves. So um, surface system has C for curves, V for surfaces. So we're gonna start with our original components of our length. These are when we're gonna call them CX and CY, where X is a meridian of that component and Y is a meridian of, of that other component. Okay, so now what you do is you build surfaces for each of those components that are disjoint from the other one. So uh, CX is bounded by VX. So we'll throw that in our surface system. In, in case you're not used to looking at these pictures much before, what this looks like is this is an annulus and then there's this twisted overpass over it, this twisted band on top of it. Okay, and then now We're gonna build a surface for the other one. Now, maybe you're looking at this and thinking, well, doesn't this other component just bound a disc? And notice I said that the surface for that component has to be disjoint from our, our CX. So surface for Y better be disjoint from CX. So in order to make it disjoint, we pair up these two intersections with this little tube, being careful with orientations. So we're going to throw both of those surfaces into our surface system. So now what you do, so throw uh, it, now that you've done that, is you want to look at the intersection curve between those two surfaces and throw that into your surface system as well. So Vx and Vy, they intersect, and we can look at where they intersect. Uh, what color do I want to use? 
what's going to show up. Maybe I'll try this green. So you can see that um, along this red tube, they're going to intersect here. They're going to intersect like that because that blue annulus is puncturing through that, that red disc. And then they're going to continue intersecting along this tube. And now once we get to that twisted overpass, it's going to go around. So this will go around like this and like this and back down like that. And I pre-drew a better picture beforehand. So you can hopefully convince yourself that this is the intersection curve between, uh, between these two. Okay, great. So now you take that curve, you throw it into your surface system. And from there, what you want to do is compute all the pairwise linking numbers of what you have. So morally, what's kind of happening is that um, CXY is a curve. Uh, indexed by the commutator of x and y. So we call it a length two curve. So call it a length two curve. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compute pairwise linking numbers of all those curves and C. So you can check that CXY has linking number zero with CX, it has linking number zero with CY, but if you take it self-linking, so the linking of CXY with its push-off, then this is actually gonna be negative one. So the, the sort of idea behind all of this stuff of Cochrane is that um, now L has a non-zero linking of weight four, and this was because C was a curve of length two. So curve of length two linking with curve of length two is a linking of weight four. Um, and therefore, one of the longitudes of L is not in F5. So if all possible linkings are trivial, then you run the process again. So this is <coughs> sort of the idea here. And maybe I'll say for experts, what this proof really relied on is computing the, um, is showing that for things in the normal closure of their pure braid group, that some of the Milner invariants have to be zero. And then, um, so I proved that. And then thanks to... Uh, Mailhan and Yasuhara, they showed using a computer program that this guy, which is a commutator of two string links, has uh, a Milner invariant of weight 9, a non-vanishing one of weight 9. And due to stuff that I proved, this means that... Um, it is not in the normal closure of the pure braid group. So this is a commutator that's not in the, the normal closure of the pure braid group and it's not trivial. Great. So um, this is by computer program. It would be nice to exhibit, the, exhibit this computation by hand, but as you can see, it's a little unwieldy. So perhaps this is better left to computers, or at least this specific computation. But maybe further questions about this that are reasonable to ask is, okay, so I showed that this quotient is not abelian. Well, what is the abelianization? So what is the abelianization of Cn mod the normal closure of Pn? Um, maybe a related question. So it's not a billion, is it solvable? So I worked on that with some, some students over the summer. We think it's not, but still it's wide open. So is this solvable? Um, does this group have finite order elements? And maybe an important thing to point out is that the pure braid group is torsion free. So if it did, that would be another very interesting difference between this and the pure braid group. And maybe more generally, we, we might ask, what is the structure of the normal closure of the pure braid group 
And uh, maybe a little bit of a niche question that I really like is, are there boundary links in it? So the last thing I want to mention is ongoing work by Harvey Park and Ray that's related to this. So Harvey Park and Ray is uh, how does the pure braid group interact with the insolvable filtration? So thank you very much for your time. And if you're, you've listened to this, this whole thing, I, I really appreciate it. And um, I think the way this works is you leave comments on the website and I'll make sure to check periodically and respond to your, your questions. So thank you so much. And thanks again to the organizers.